JB, in uh, right after this interview, you'll be heading back home, I guess, right? Well, no, I'm headed to Elkins, uh, and then Buchanan, and then home, and then back out tomorrow. I think back to Buchanan. Gotcha. All right. So, what are yeah. you do, what are you doing in the Eastern Panhandle today? Yeah. So I was actually here yesterday, um, and I had some meetings last night. But I was I was meeting with some folks who were doing um, really first class work in the homelessness and substance abuse area. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you guys out here have this incredible, um, growth and your economy is going so well that sometimes, um, the underlying problems that rear their head sort of more publicly in places that don't have the same, um, the same positive things happening are, are, are happening here too. And, um, there's some really awesome people trying to, to build a really amazing facility over behind the casino in Ransom. Uh, and I was out taking a tour and, and I'll be headed home trying to help them secure funding to make sure that this happens. And that was my next question, which is, what is the state auditor's interest in uh, these visits? <laughs> uh, this particular interest is, is um, you know, we work very, very hard to make sure that our state government is spending its money um, effectively, efficiently, and in ways that generate results for taxpayers. Um, and one of the things that I have um, been keenly aware of and, and tried very hard to, to use as much of my time as possible is finding people who marry the ideals of, of faith and redemption um, with uh, compassion. And the folks out here um, with the Jefferson County um, Coalition are doing just exactly that. So the entire idea of their project is um, we, we will help anybody for any reason, um, but essentially the second time you need help, we're going we're gonna to make sure that you have a job. Uh, and that you're you're learning how to fish instead of us just handing you fish every day. And, and JB, uh, I know we've covered this before, but uh, just in case, uh, as you pointed out, in the Eastern Panhandle, we have a lot of growth. So there's new people moving in every day, discovering this show and discovering what our constitutional officers do. As the West Virginia State Auditor, you don't necessarily audit the state departments as much as you're in charge of making sure you're auditing the local governments. Is that correct? Well, I audit every single one of the state's payments, and my duty as it relates to the state government is to tell every taxpayer, all the legislators, and the media uh, what was spent. So we keep the official record. Uh, and in so doing, um, we have created something called the West Virginia Checkbook, uh, and the checkbook is now available in 40 counties and 70 cities, every single uh, school board and the state government, and it allows you to see in real time every dollar, uh, how the state or your government spends every one of your dollars, um, and we have uh, made West Virginia the most transparent state and local governments in the entire country, meaning that every taxpayer and business in West Virginia has more access to their government information here than they do any other place in the entire country. And, and why that's important is the entire idea of service is that every single voter should be able to hold every single elected official and every bureaucrat accountable every two or four years for every action they make. And that's impossible if the bureaucracy and, and elected officials, uh, which have been doing for the last 150 years, do everything in their power to make sure that you don't know what they've done. Uh, and that's what creates, you know, the, these sort of uh, political dynasties. And, and it creates the idea that, like, all of the all of the incumbents always get to win. Right. And so it's sort of our idea to shake that up and give voters a, a level playing field um, to to understand what the government has done with what is ultimately their money. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, I've definitely used it to look at some of the uh, just budgetary aspects of uh, government, and I think that it's a great invention. I also seen that you co-signed this uh, the state TikTok ban. Is that correct? Yes, I did. So, do you want to kind of uh, work into you know uh, sure. why why that? I'm happy to do that, and I'd love to talk to you guys just a little bit about my legislative agenda when we get done doing that. But but on the TikTok side. So my office is in charge of, of doing the entire payroll for the state. So we run about 63,000 people's paychecks every two weeks. Um, it's one of those wildly thankless jobs where if you get 63,999 of them right, you have made one person very, very bad. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, 100%. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we look at it that way. And, and about seven months ago, uh, hackers broke into our software company, uh, a company called Kronos, and shut it down. And so we have a fully automated payroll system. Hackers got into our system, not to our system, the Kronos system, and shut the code down. 
And so we had to pivot basically on the week of Christmas to do 64,000 paychecks by hand because somebody was able to shut down our cloud-based software company, Unreal. right? And so when you start to look at what TikTok is, right, is, is it fun? Yes. But from an, a governmental standpoint, it is also a portal for those who wish to do us harm. And there is just an enormous amount of, of evidence that the Chinese government uses things like this to, to try to meddle and, and to monkey with uh, American interests. And it just the risk isn't worth any of the reward, in my opinion. Absolutely. I appreciate you uh, speaking on that. Um, I also saw that uh, you support the child tax credit. And um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, one, because I agree in a lot of, you know, family aspects and family policies. I think that, you know, uh, some people are nervous that the entitlement state is, uh, you know, prolonging adolescence. But I, I do believe that family oriented policies can uh, reshape that. And so do you want to talk about um, your legislative effort and maybe some input on the child tax credit? Sure. So one of the things um, that we see in, in this state is that we have, number one, we have child care deserts. Mm -hmm. um, it is very, very difficult for people, especially people with low income, to afford child care if they can even find it. And so as we are, we are trying to position ourselves, and in, in, in what I like to say is this is without question, if you are a young family in this country, there is no better place to raise your family than right here. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But in order for us to say that truthfully, there's a few things we got to work on. And the idea that, that from ages two to five, um, our state, I think, can really, really step up to make sure that families have the resources they need so that their children can be taken care of and so that they can get to work. Um, and on top of that, we also have an enormous amount of children that are in foster care. We have an enormous amount of children that aren't in foster care and should be. Um, and we have an enormous amount of, unfortunately, substance abuse and poverty uh, that, that goes along with it that causes students to, to be unprepared when they get to kindergarten. And so I think one of our great, uh, one of the things that we need to be used, doing with these surpluses and, and the, the momentum that we have is finding really creative ways to make us the premier place to have a two to five year old so that our kids are being fed, they're being loved, they're, they're being taken care of, and parents can get to work and help our economy. And on top of that, to the children who are being sort of left behind, these systems are going to get them ready so when they start at kindergarten, they aren't behind, which is going to make sure that they're able to read by grade level three. And we all know that that is um, that one of the most important metrics in all of education. So if we're going to fix these, the test scores and, and make our education system um, the place that our teachers deserve it to be, the first step is to get our kids on the glide path to success as young as humanly possible. And I think that's our duty. Maria. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. McCuskey. Uh, so Hi. would you take um, our big fat state surplus, any piece of that, and allocate it toward these particular programs that you're talking about? Yes. Oh. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> that was a quick answer then. Um, and, and how do you envision doing that? I mean, you talked about a legislative agenda. So do you intend to go lobby the legislature in order to make that uh, occur? Um, because there are a lot of people out there with their hands out right now. So. Sure. Well, the first thing you have to do, and I'll get into my legislative agenda in a second, the first thing you have to do, and, and this is a statewide problem, this is something that my office has worked very, very hard to try to solve, and that is we need to understand, we need to have a better understanding um, of why we're failing. And there's several key areas why our government fails, right? Our education system is obviously not producing the results that it should be. That is obvious. We have water and sewer infrastructure problems that are beyond, uh, beyond reproach, right? And they are pervasive and they're everywhere and there are billions of dollars uh, worth of, of investment that needs to happen and you go back and look at DHHR which actually coincides with our education system but the results aren't there right that our lifespans are too short the health of our people is not high enough we have too many kids in foster care that and, and it, it's been beaten to, to death but the answer is is what are we doing to collect data to figure out why we're failing because the answer to a lot of these problems isn't more spending sometimes we have plenty of money if you spend it properly but you have to undertake the very difficult process of analyzing what you're doing, admitting that you're failing, and then finding out why. Uh, because here's what happens in state government is, is bureaucrats walk into the finance committee room and, and, and a legislator says, why are you failing at this? 
And what's their answer every single time? I don't have enough money. Not enough money. Well, mm-hmm. you're going to run out of somebody else's money eventually. And at some point, when we're spending $7 billion on DHHR, $4 billion on education, the federal government gave us $11 billion to fix our infrastructure. We borrowed $2 billion more to fix our roads. That doesn't feel like a spending problem. That feels like a process problem. And for us, for my office, our great goal is to turn our government into a data-driven process improvement agency that looks at taxpayers as customers and is constantly trying to improve the results that they're delivering to them using their tax dollars. We have largely been um, stonewalled uh, in in trying to to turn the ship around, Um, but we've seen a lot of progress and we've put a lot of processes in place that when we find some new people who are really looking at new ideas, I think the state is gonna gonna thrive very, very quickly. Um, So that's your first step, is to figure out if you have enough money, and then the second step is to figure out how much money it costs. Um, But that isn't necessarily part of my legislative agenda this year. That is sort of a passion project of mine. I work with several legislators who who are uh, educators and and are um, really interested in, in making sure that these things happen. Patricia Rucker is somebody who I work with a lot whose opinion on education is um, something that matters to me. And when I have a great idea, I usually go to her to, to, to bounce it around. State Auditor J.B. McCuskey is our guest. Now, J.B., I have been around a lot of candidate speeches in my day, <laughs> and I'm thinking that sounded a lot like a governor's speech. Indeed it yeah. did. Candidate yeah. speech to me as I was listening That's to you just talk. That's how I talk, Rob. You know that. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, spe- That's just how I talk like that all the time. Speaking of that, I know you, you've professed interest in uh, being governor in the past on this program, and obviously that chair is going to be open this year. I've not seen your name so far submitted as a candidate. Well, that's because my name so far has not been submitted as a candidate. I have an enormous amount of work to do this legislative session. My office has so many things going on. Um, It is obviously something that you and I've talked about. It is something that is very, very front of mind for me. You know, when you are somebody who, who is from this state and whose entire professional life has been dedicated to finding ways to make sure that people in West Virginia have access to the same level of prosperity as everyone else does. The idea that you might be able to be the governor, the idea that that's even possible is so unbelievably flattering. And it's so um, it, it is it's nerve wracking at the same time. You know, one of the things that I like to say is, is that in America today, one of our big problems is our politicians worry more about uh, they're, they're more nervous about losing than they are about winning. The scariest day in any politician's life should be the morning after they win an election, because that's when you have to actually do the work for the people that elected you. If you lose, your burdens are completely gone. (laughs) Then it's somebody else's burden. Public service and elections are about taking care of the people who have given you the, 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 the honor of representing them. And so for me, that's what Winning is what makes me the most nervous, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, because that's the time when you have to look everybody in the eye and say, these are my ideas, I'm putting this to paper, and this is how we're going to move West Virginia forward. That is when the rubber meets the road. And I think we have far too many people uh, in politics today who are uh, seeking fame, uh, and they're, they're much more uh, concerned about their electoral success than they are about the results that they plan to deliver uh, if they were to win. If you were to run, is there a time frame when you would be making that decision? Sometime in the next uh, before. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was going to say sometimes before the election. <laughs> it, 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 the, the, you know, for some reason, people have moved these timelines up pretty significantly. Right. Yes. I mean, for the, the gubernatorial election in West Virginia used to be nine months long. And now people are announcing, you know, two weeks after the other election. But um, I would say that sometime early spring in the, in the next month and a half or two months um we can get the legislative we can get our part of the legislative session behind us one of the things that we are really uh in tune to do is to provide really world-class service for all our legislators so they have access to data as they make these incredibly important decisions and so i like to make sure that you know all of that is taken care of i'm totally uh of free mind and you know i'll sit down and talk to my wife we'll pray about it um we'll, we'll ask our kids you know they're seven and five but they have a They have a say in these things, and then we'll make a decision. Because once you decide to run for governor, that's your life. And it's going to be, you know, that is is something that you have to completely commit yourself to, both campaigning um, and uh, as a lifestyle. And so, 
you know, we'll make sure that we're talking, talking to the guy above and, and we're making this decision as a family because it affects everyone in my family. As you look at this legislative session, what things are important to you about it as far as it affects the auditor's office and the state? Sure. So the, what, we have three or four bills that are really important. The first one that I think is really cool is called the, the Prompt Pay Act. And what this does is it, it forces the, the state bureaucracy to start paying its bills on time. Uh, what I find is I work with contractors and, and vendors every day, and the, the payment processes on our, on the, in the bureaucracy are, are muddled and slow, and people are getting paid three, four, five months after they submit invoices. And what that does is it reduces the amount of people that bid on products, and it makes everything that our state does cost more. So what this is going to do is it's going to impose a penalty on the bureaucracy uh, for every day after 45 days that, a, that an invoice is unpaid. Um, we have to start meeting our private industry leaders halfway, and we have to start doing a better job of making sure that we're, we're paying them for the work that they do um, for us. The second thing we're doing, you guys remember the dilapidated buildings bill. Um, I'm so thankful to Senator Tarr to, for taking leadership on that. Um, and we are adding a couple of provisions to that. So what we've started to find throughout this country is nations of concern, countries like China and, and Russia and North Korea are trying to buy delinquent tax property so that they can own parts of America and control our mineral interests and our farm interests. And we're going to be introducing some legislation that makes it so those pe people that are associated with those governments are, are unable to buy property from the state of West Virginia for those sort of nefarious purposes. Um, we also have a bill. I'm sure you guys have seen how credit card companies are strangely starting to try to track people's gun purchases. Um, my office is the, is the T-card coordinator for the state. We manage a $3 billion purchasing card contract. Um, and we are going to, to, to impose uh, bidding penalties for any company that violates uh, the Second Amendment and the privacy of the First Amendment that goes along with it. Um, and uh, aside from that, we have some cleanup bills. We're trying to, to, to get our office out of, up from underneath state purchasing. We find it to be sort of burdensome. Um, but other than that, our office is constantly trying to do everything we can to make our government smaller and to make uh, all of your listeners and everybody in West Virginia's tax dollars go as far as we possibly can. So quick question. Um, yes. uh, the uh, the tax bill uh, sailed yes. through the the House yesterday. Um, and, uh, you know, the the fate is a little unclear in well, a lot unclear in the Senate. Do West Virginians deserve a big tax refund? Here's the deal. Uh, yes. If the government has more money than it needs, it needs to send the money that it got back to the people that gave it to them. And the amount of that money and the way that you do that is up to the legislature. But at the end of the day, if we have $6 billion and we only need $4.5 billion, $1.5 billion should go back to the people of the state of West Virginia. That's just simple math. Um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to, to working with the legislators uh, to find what is the appropriate way to do that, right? There's, there are, um, there's a, a myriad of, of methods to do that, but... The, the long and the short of it is, is people like to talk about tax breaks as they might bring in new, new West Virginians. I like to think of tax breaks first as how do we give back the money from the West Virginians that are already working here, already doing the right thing, already funding our government? How do we get their money back to them first? Because to me, they're our first priority. Alonzo. Wonderful. Um, how much input does the state auditor's office have in weighing incentives of some of these bills? And uh, is, it, is this more of a, a, a council role? I mean, are you, are you signing off on the bill in, in that aspect? Or is it more, you know, is there more involvement with the state auditors that maybe uh, the layman might not be familiar with? Yeah, no, there really isn't much. It's as much as legislators want there to be. So I don't specifically have a duty that way other than to present them the data that they ask for. So that we see our job specifically as it comes to spending and budgeting as, as giving the legislators access to a financial system that they otherwise would have no access to. One of the things that bureaucracies do to maintain their status and their power is they create systems that decision makers can't access, right? Mm -hmm. And so one, what OpenGov does and what our checkbook does and what our office does is we take that system and make it accessible to people who may not be accounting professionals, who may not understand how to manipulate complicated, you know, statewide accounting systems so that they can make those decisions with the right data and an understanding of how those decisions are going to affect people in real time. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, the, I guess, uh, a follow-up question to that is, do you think that that puts you in a unique perspective if you so choose to run for governor? I think that the next governor of our state is going to have to truly understand how to reform bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. I think that this governor um, has done a wonderful job of making economic development a um, uh, the premier part of his administration, and our economic development team is doing phenomenally. I think legislators uh, for the last 10 years have done a really, really great job of reforming some of our antiquated laws and making this place um, shine in a way that businesses will look at it and say, I can, I can thrive there. And I think the last part of this three-legged stool is, is we have to sit down and figure out how to make our bureaucracy work for taxpayers. How do we, how do we make the state government understand that every single action they take must be for the interest of a taxpayer? Find out what the appropriate size of this government is. How do we make it run uh, it more effectively and more efficiently and implement those policies? And that, that is hard change. But, but I, to answer your question, my office has given me a wildly unique look into every single nook and cranny of our state's bureaucracy and given me uh, really unique insight and tools on how to fix it. JB, appreciate your time today. Here any uh, final thoughts before you head on your way to Elkins? Uh, all I'll say is, is it really is nice out here. It is. <laughs> I mean, you wake up. I'm staying at the Bavarian, and first of all, this hotel is unbelievable. But, you know, it is – you guys have a remarkable place to live, and, and I, I hope that everyone that, that gets to live here uh, appreciates how beautiful and cool this spot is. I, I just love it here. Yes, and make sure you let all your friends in the legislature from your area of the state know it costs a lot more to live here, too. Indeed. So <laughs> locality pay would be great to pass. <laughs> hey, Rob. Sounds like you got the last word. <laughs> <laughs> JB, great to talk with you again, man. Hey, guys. Y'all have Thank a you. Thank you.